Thank you very much to the Chancellor. May I now move to the Shadow Chancellor, second speaker from the opposition team, Mr. Lee Jia Wei. Your Excellency, Honourable Panel, Mr. Chair, uh, my lovely opponents, well, my teammates, not quite nearly as lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Now, as an awkward, slightly romantically challenged and shockingly single young man, I have some words of advice to Mrs. Merkel. Breaking up is hard to do. The proposition thinks Europe is defined by failed politics, beautiful women and stunted growth, when really what all they're doing is describing Mr. Nicholas Sarkozy. Honestly, our argument here is that their claim, rather, is that Germany would feel liberated from its burdensome neighbors, happy for a moment, happy that they have 27% of their GDP back, or something along those lines. But if you forgive me for being crude, that's slightly like well, masturbation, winning the battle, but really losing the war. <laughs> In the long run, ladies and gentlemen, we want to think of... We want to think of two things, right? They claim to us that, well, we can't save Europe, so let's just give up. Their response is... One, Germany's role is not to save Europe in the I'm a Superman sense, but just to stop them dying before restructuring takes place. We're not idealists here. We don't think restructuring will take place overnight. Give them a couple of years, long-term austerity measures, and then investment in the economy. No, thank you, madam. Building confidence, in other words. The next claim is if Germany's always there to prop you up, then, well, the economy, well, rather, these countries won't be responsible ever. They have no incentive. Question. Why would you want to destroy your own economy ever, right? I'm pretty sure they've been punished quite enough by the existence of a crisis that has basically left half their country in the quagmire. That's not quite a situation that changes whether or not Germany saves them or otherwise. Point, no, thank you, madam. In fact, I think that rather simplistic conception of how economics works in the Eurozone, I think, needs to be exposed. So let's think about two things in the economic frame, I suppose, as Michael promised. Let's first of all think about the costs. What happens when the Eurozone breaks up? And bear in mind, they admit they want the Eurozone to break up. And honestly, it's going to be a massive, unmitigated disaster, like the Kardashians playing Scrabble in some ways, right? <laughs> Firstly, there's a sudden and unparalleled shock, I think, to the financial system. Huge uncertainty and panic on the markets just because every single investor will wonder what in the world is going on in Europe right now. We're going to let them die, as the motion suggests. Therefore, all investors know, thank you, sir, begin to pull out. A massive capital flight occurs. Even if the EU attempts to impose capital controls, what these guys will do is, like they did in Thailand during the AFC in 97, carry literally suitcases, no thank you madam, of money across borders just to make sure that their cash doesn't suddenly disappear. So literally, the entire Eurozone will fall apart into economic ruin. That's not something that countries recover from quite so easily as Argentina and countless other examples have demonstrated to us. Secondly, the creditors' assets suddenly become, no thank you sir, meaningless liabilities. And these assets, I think, are like basically debts that are owed to them, in Germany's case, from the rest of Europe. Many of Germany's debts are debts, for example, owed by Greece. They're currently denominated in euros. Sorry. No thank you sir. The problem is, if the euro breaks up, then it's replaced by the drachma, which they again admit will become worthless. So $7 billion worth of debt at this moment becomes $700 billion worth of debt, which is something that Greece will never ever, hang on a moment there, sir, ever be able to afford. Therefore, it becomes a default. So something that reflects, it's reflected on government spreadsheets in Germany as an asset suddenly becomes liabilities. That's a recipe for economic disaster. Wouldn't you agree, sir? Wouldn't Greece really be better off if they were to have a very loose monetary policy and inflate away some of their debt so that they would recover instead of being held back by Germany imposing austerity measures? I would agree with you, except then we'd both be wrong, you see. I'll talk about that just a little bit later when I discuss with you the real benefits that that has on freedom of purchase in Europe. But hang on a moment, I'll flag that for you, right? So if all of the above come true, then Germany's primary export market, as Michael has already explained to you, collapses. 61% of trade, as we uh, took out, I guess, from the 2012 IMF statistics, not quite so out of date, right? They say we can just shift markets. No, thank you, madam. You don't shift markets so easily because, again, there's a limited number of people you can sell things to in the world. If you lose 61% of those, you can replace them with maybe 100 Chinese consumers. That's not going to make up for that 61%. No, thank you, sir. So, really, if the euro breaks up, huge disaster for Germany and the rest of Europe. What can we gain from keeping the eurozone? No, thank you, madam. Four freedoms that I want to talk about. One, freedom of capital. Again, very loose capital controls in Europe, and the fact that the common currency reduces financial speculation on currency and minimizes transaction costs means investment is a lot easier in Europe, which, again, encourages people to put their money and spend it in Europe. 
But second of all, this freedom of movement, what does this mean? Schengen has basically made it incredibly easy for Europeans to move across the border and decreases administrative costs for companies. So employers are very, very likely to hire Europeans ahead of Americans just because it's cheaper and just because it's easier. And again, that increases employment yes, all across Europe. No, thank you, sir. Thirdly, there's freedom of production. Big European firms can now spread the supply chains all across Europe, across areas in which these countries have comparative advantages at very low cost. And this, again, increases competitiveness in Europe. Best example, Airbus, which produces engines in the United Kingdom, structural fuselage in Germany, in Hamburg, and furnishing in Toulouse, which is typical, I guess, that the Germans build it, the French make it pretty. You increase competitiveness, therefore, and employment 21,000 people hired by Airbus, in fact, far more than Boeing in the United States, for Europe. Fourth of all, freedom of purchase, and this is where I'm responding to his POI. For Germany, you keep the euro competitively valued because other countries depress the value and ensure Germany can export its way out of crisis. So if their difficulty, as they try to point out, is that Germany is suffering a little bit, they would do really well to stay in the eurozone and ensure that they enjoy the benefits of a currency that gives it export advantages and helped it, helped make it rather the second largest exporter in the world. But secondly, pertaining to countries like Greece, for example, the first thing it does is prevent a currency collapse. If your entire currency benefits from loose monetary policy and nobody in the universe wants to buy the drachma, then again, your currency means nothing. But second of all, you don't really increase this country's competitiveness in the long run because your problem there is structural difficulties. Your people are not competitive. So if the Greeks can only export pistachios in Greek tragedy, then quite honestly, the fact that they have a cheaper drachma doesn't change anything. I'm really, really proud to oppose this motion. Thank you.